what I'd like to do is introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Chris Haskins. Dr. Haskins received her bachelor's in biology and her master's in animal behavior at the University of Kentucky and completed her PhD in mycorrhizal <laughs> ecology in pinyon juniper woodlands at Northern Arizona Uni University, NAU, in 2003. Dr. Haskins began at the Arboretum in 2006 as the Director of Research. In 2019, she took the position of Executive Director. For 15 years, she administered and managed federal, state, and foundation-funded projects. The foci of these projects ranged from rare plant monitoring and demography studies to climate change public education to invasive species management. The Conservation and Research Department at the Arbor Arboretum currently pr participates in three areas of work, recovery of rare plant species, restoration of disturbed habitats, and research in native plant ecology and horticultural practices. Much of the work that Dr. Haskins has conducted since joining the Arboretum culminated in the publication of a co-edited volume in 2012 entitled Plant Reintroduction in a, Cli in a Changing Climate, Promises and Perils. In addition to performing peer reviews for over a dozen professional journals, Dr. Haskins serves as the board secretary for the Southwest Vegetation Management Association. So I think you're probably the busiest person that I know. <laughs> Well, thank you for that very illustrious introduction. It, it does sound like a lot when you say it. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Um, so we'll turn the program over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you all tonight. Um, as the title slide says here, we will be talking about attracting and feeding our feathered friends, really focusing on some native landscaping options. And let's hit that button. So although you already heard a little bit about me, I thought it might be useful um, if I told you a little bit more and how a plant ecologist actually has this kind of vested interest and in, um, passionate also looking at and feeding birds. So I actually grew up in a very small town in New Hampshire. Um, I did finish two degrees at the U of K, not the U of A, and for those of us who are in the know, the U of K is the University of Kentucky. Um, I did take ornithology as a graduate student, although I do have to be honest, I audited the class because at the time I was not a morning person and was not capable of those early morning field trips. I hit the afternoon ones and the evening ones, but the mornings, they were out for me. I didn't become a morning person until I had children. Um, during that time, while I was in Kentucky, I actually got to spend some time working at a Wild Birds Unlimited store, and it's a chain, it's a franchise, and I don't know that you guys actually have them out west, but it was really a great learning opportunity to kind of get a feel for, you know, if you're going to be using bird feeders, what kinds of seeds and seed mixes can you use to attract different bird species? All different types of feeders, how best to use them, how to arrange them. Um, all kinds of really good stuff. And it was really a fun hobby for me as a graduate student to feed the birds and learn birds that way because I had very little money. <laughs> I couldn't travel. I couldn't afford really nice binoculars, but I could afford a little bird seed in a nice bird feeder. Um, I did graduate. I moved out here after about 10 years at Kentucky and I moved to um, Flagstaff to attend NAU where I completed a PhD in 2003, really focusing on plant ecology. So while my Kentucky years were kind of more animal focused, when I came out here, I actually became more plant focused. I actually have recently retired from the Arbery and Met Flagstaff as of the end of 21, and I'm moving on to some different things, which includes spending more time with my kids. Um, but that's kind of to give you an idea of how while I do have a very plant-focused um, kind of background, I've always had this passion and love for animals, including birds. And I can't leave without mentioning what my favorite bird is, which is the western bluebird, pictured here. A little fun thing, which I'm sure all of you already know, is that 
In addition to their bug diet, they will also eat berries. So it is possible to draw these beautiful birds into your own environment by offering an assortment of food types. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So I did mention already that birding is, it's not just kind of a hobby, uh, but it's a great way to learn and to learn about the different birds in your area. But I would even say, especially with kind of my background and my knowledge of climate change, that it's even more important now to feed birds, learn about these birds, because so many of them are threatened. So I can't get through this talk without this, this little plug that, you know, feeding the birds isn't just for fun anymore. It is still fun. Don't get me wrong. It's a great hobby, but it's actually become incredibly important to help um, bolster the habitat of many different bird species. There are so many different factors, unfortunately, right now that are contributing to the decline of birds, including development and habitat loss. One bullet that I didn't put on here was a shift in increasing predators. Um, climate change is a huge one. We are seeing shifts in a phenology, which is basically phenology is the study of the important timing of biological events. So a plant, for example, that would be when do the buds break and you see flowering. For a bird, it might be when does migration set in. Um, so these shifts in the timing of these events is kind of really important when a migrating bird is depending on having a food source at its arrival point, and if that food source isn't ready, things don't go very well. Um, increasing drought or extreme weather events, all of things, these things can contribute to the decline in bird species. As a matter of fact, according to the National Audubon Society, two thirds of North American birds are at increasing risk of extinction from global temperature rise including this handsome fellow right here, the broad-tailed hummingbird, which is one of the species that we can see locally. So the Audubon Society, while offering, as you know, many, many wonderful benefits and field trips, as Kay already mentioned, they also have some really great and very cool online tools, including this one right here, which is survival by degrees. And you can find this by going to the, I think it's the, just the National Audubon page and looking at the climate section. And what this tool does is you can enter your zip code, for example, and I kind of did um, a, a screenshot for Coconino County, and it's a predictor for how many bird species will be at high risk versus medium risk versus low risk versus stable for your given area and depending on different climate scenarios. So of course I picked the extreme. If we see a three degree increase in temperatures, then what we might expect for the summer season, you can also choose season, is 42 high, highly vulnerable species. This is pretty depressing. This is, this is kind of bummer news, but it's good to know because if we're not aware of it, then we don't know to take action. But to counter some of this kind of bummer news that this tool can give you, um, they do also offer ways to help with conservation of these species. And I, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. I suppose you probably are, but the Southwest Audubon Birdathon is May 7th through 15th this year, so it's right around the corner. It's a great way to not only support bird conservation, but it's a great way to get outside and just have fun watching the birds. And I took this screenshot just a couple days ago and it looks like there were only two people registered, so there's plenty of room. <laughs> You're not gonna get locked out. Um, but I hope more people do get to participate in this, what sounds like a really fun event and help raise some funding to support uh, a lot of our local bird species. But enough about the kind of national pitch for the plight of our bird species. Let's talk a little bit more about our topic tonight. So tonight we are gonna take a phytocentric view to attracting birds. And essentially all that means is that a plant-based focus to how we can attract birds. So plants, as many of you I'm sure are aware, 
basically form the basis of all life. If we didn't have plants, none of us would be here. It is the, the building block for all of our food webs and food chains. Now, from a bird point of view, what is it that they get from plants? Well, they can get nectar, which is yummy and delicious food source. They can also uh, achieve um, or feed on fruits and seeds from the plants. So the fruit is just the fleshy part that covers a seed. And then another really important part that plants play in the role of birds is by providing habitat. And this is something when people think about, how am I going to bring birds into my yard? I want to see more and more. You know, they always think about what can they feed them, but we spend less time thinking about, well, how can I provide habitat for them? So we'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. And more specifically, why do we want to use native plants? So there's a, many, many reasons. I just chose to highlight a few of them here. One of which is to maintain ecological relationships. So think of it like this. So as a human, you know, you live in your little community and we shop at the grocery store and we buy the same types of groceries probably every week and maybe we mix them up and have different meals, but we have kind of a routine with our food sources. When we travel, sometimes we get what I like to call travel tummy. Um, this is how I pitch it to my children when they were very small. But you're eating foods from different places that might not be what you're used to. You're having different water sources. Sometimes it can make you a little sour. We'll just leave it at that. Um, and it's not comfortable. It's not a comfortable feeling. And it's because we're out of that relationship that our, our gut has developed with the foods we typically eat. This does not differ from any of the wild animals or domestic animals for that point that we have in our lives. When we start feeding them things that they're not accustomed to or they're not used to, it does take a while to adjust to that. And that process of converting probably isn't all that comfortable. Not to mention, we still don't know hardly anything probably of what these new foods might do to them or what kinds of effects they might have. The second bullet there is that we want to use natives to minimize the impacts of invasive species. Now I could provide probably multiple other lectures just on invasive species alone. I won't do that here tonight, but you'd be probably shocked to realize how many of the top 10 invasive species, you know, in the state across the country came from horticulture. They were sold as ornamental plants because somebody thought they were pretty. Somebody saw birds sitting on it and took a photo. I was like, oh, I want to have that and put it in my yard. And lo and behold, these non-native invasive species realize, hey, I can grow here just as well as I can in Asia. And they take over. And I'll give you one good example of this is uh, toad flax or Linaria dalmatica. That's also called, I think, butter and eggs. It's pretty. It, it looks like a yellow uh, snapdragon, if you can picture that. Um, but it's incredibly invasive and will form these monocultures that um, are really hard to get rid of once they take hold. So we don't want to encourage that. Um, but probably the most important reason why we want to use natives is that these plants are already adapted to our dry, high elevation environments. And given our current uh, kind of water resource levels and water predictions, we need to be as efficient as we can in the way we use water. So the way to go is native plants. All right, so tonight's roadmap in a little more detail, we're going to talk about three different groups of plants. We'll talk about some nectar plants, some fruit and seed plants, and some habitat plants. But something I want you to keep in mind is that although we'll be highlighting certain species in each of these categories, there is lots of crossover. For example, some you know, fruit plants also provide great seeds and they also, some nectar plants can also provide great habitat. So while we're featuring some species in each of these categories, just remember that they can serve multiple purposes. So a couple of questions as we move through these different plants that I wanna address are, what are some of the proven flagstaff species? 
And you know, since I'm presenting, we'll be hitting mostly my favorites. Um, but just keep in mind, again, that there are lots of different options. We have some wonderful native species here. And the second thing is, how can we optimize diversity? Not just diversity of what you're planting, but also diversity of what you're attracting. So with that said, let's take a look at some nectar producing plants. So I <laughs> always like to remind people, because even I kind of forget this sometimes, is actually not all plants that are flower producing produce nectar. Penstemons are one of those uh, genera or group of plants that do produce nectar. So you know, it's, it's, this is a lot more fun when I can be more interactive, but what I will say is that the plants that produce nectar are those that are pollinated by animals. They use that nectar production as a way to draw in either birds or insects. Those birds and insects then go into that flower to grab the nectar but get covered with pollen and that way can spread the pollen about. So, but if your pollen is wind distributed, there's really no need to produce that very expensive, I should say biologically expensive nectar product. So that said, um, some of my favorite pensimens, and pensimens are just an amazing, wonderful group of plants to grow here in Northern Arizona. They come in a variety of sizes. They come in a huge array of different colors. They you know, can go anywhere from very dry environments to wetter environments, um, and they're really just beautiful. So the first species I want to highlight here is Penstemon pinifolius. What the picture is showing is actually a cultivar. This cultivar is Mercia yellow, but it is typically commonly available. The original um, form of this plant is got actually an orangish flower, but it looks very similar. Everything but the flower color is similar. It typically grows to about 18 inches in height. It blooms from June through about September or so. The next one that you see there is Penstemon Whipley Annis. And I love this one for its deep, rich purple color. It grows to about 24 inches in height um, and blooms from July to August. And then the third one there is Penstemon Barbatus, um, also known as Scarlet Bugler, Scarlet Bugler, Here's my thing about pet, uh, common names. Common names can often refer to multiple species. So I like to stick to the Latin names so it's very clear which species I'm talking about. Uh, but this particular pensamen can get to almost four feet in height and blooms from June to October. Now the information that I'm providing you below those images is kind of to give you an idea of the diversity in the range that these different species can provide. So one of the things that we wanna think of when it comes to diversity and how can we attract different birds is looking at different colors. So just like people, like I have a favorite color, my husband has a different favorite color. I'm sure my kids have different favorite colors. You know, not all bird species are attracted to the same color. So offering things that are in different colors will also be a benefit to increasing that diversity. And I should also mention, while you know, tonight's focus is birds, this same kind of design for putting together an environment works for other pollinators as well. So if you're interested in attracting butterflies or different bees, um, different things that can you know, come and pollinate your plants, um, this same concept will work. So the other thing, so you see array of colors here, and something else I wanna point out is an arrangement of timing. So you'll see the Pensman Penifolius blooms from June to September. Pensman Whipleanus has a much shorter bloom time of July to August, whereas Pensman Barbados can go, Barbados can go from June to October. So let's say, for example, you picked, I'm just going to plant Pensamon Whipleanus. I love it. It's beautiful. I want to have it all over the place. Well, come September or October, if that is the only nectar producing flower or plant that you have in your garden area, um, birds are going to go elsewhere because, you know, while they, you'd like to think they were loyal, they're not. They're going to go where the food is. 
So it's important to keep a variety of things that have different kind of nectar producing in bloom time so you can kind of extend that season. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so something else to think about, which you know I kind of hinted at on the last slide was adding dimension with different heights and sizes of plants. So again, just like people, I mean, bird, not all birds like to feed on the ground. Not all birds like to feed high up on a tree. Some like to feed at two feet, some like to feed at four feet. So kind of offering different plant species that can be found at these different heights and levels is yet another way to kind of increase the diversity. So some of my favorite plants for doing this are um, Arizona honeysuckle, which is Lonicera arizonica. So this is a woody vine that if you just kind of let it go naturally, will kind of, you know, not get that high off the ground. But if you provide it a trellis or something to go up, it can go up as high as the trellis does. So it's very flexible that way. Has beautiful red little trumpet-like flowers. The next one is Mirabilis multiflora or showy four o'clock. This, this is a beautiful, beautiful plant when it's in bloom. For those of you who don't know, four o'clocks get that name because those blooms typically open around four o'clock. Um, they're actually very punctual. It's, it's pretty amazing. These, a mature plant will get up to about two feet in height and they have beautiful magenta flowers. And then another honeysuckle, which is also a woody species, but has much more of a, I would say, shrub growth form, is twinberry honeysuckle, or Lonicera involucrata. This can get up to about seven feet in height. It's a very hardy and durable kind of woody shrub. Um, this, remember from the beginning, I said a lot of these species will play multiple roles. So while the flowers will produce nectar, this is also a really great fruit producing variety. And you can see the two yellowish flowers that are coming out um, will produce the two little berries that you will see later in the season, hence the name twinberry. Okay, so let's move on and talk a little bit about fruit and seed producing plants. Um, it's important to know that many of the fruits, while you'll see them, it's nice to see them when they're fresh. Because that's, you know, when you and I want to eat fruit, we want to eat it when it's nice and plump and juicy and fresh. But birds, I don't think, are quite that particular. So when these fruits dry, they can stay on those twigs and on those plants for a considerable amount of time and still supply a really nutritious food source through the fall and even into the winter. So this is a great kind of season extension type food to be able to offer. And some of my favorites are Rosa woodsii, which is also known as Woods Rose. It has like eight other common names, but I call it Woods Rose. It can get to be about seven feet in height. It has beautiful and incredibly fragrant pink flowers. It's a member of the Rose family, obviously. And that little corner shot up there is the fruit that it produces. It's called a rose hip. And these are edible for humans as well. A lot of people will make a jelly or usually a jelly out of them. Um, but the birds really like them too. So if the birds don't beat you to them, then you can collect them as well. Another one that's a little bit lower in stature is Berberus rapens. Used to be Mahonia rapens. I think it's Berberus now. Um, also known as creeping barberry. This is a good kind of almost a ground cover type species um, that produces yellow flowers and uh, clusters of these delicious little berries that the birds really like. But again, this is where you can have something kind of low to the ground for those ground feeding birds. And then another wonderful, slightly larger shrub is elderberry or Sambucus glauca. This gets to be about 20 feet in height and mature. It has yellowish white flowers in these huge sprays of delicious looking berries that birds like. Um, I think they're edible to people as well. I have not tried them myself, but I'm not recommending it until you actually research that on your own. But berries are a wonderful way to offer fruit to a lot of our fruit eating bird species. 
And another wonderful thing, once those fruits have uh, oftentimes passed or the fleshy part has been shed, is you get a nice little seed. And seeds are these basically kind of long lasting bursts of fats and oils that are a great source of energy, um, especially for a lot of our smaller birds. Um, some of my favorite species here include Circeum wheeleri or Wheeler's thistle. It has a beautiful delicate lavender flower and blooms from June to October. Now I have to say something about thistles. So in the wonderful state of Arizona, we have about 17 species of thistle. Not all of them are nice. So we have a significant portion of what I like to call nasty invasive thistle species. Just by glance, they tend to be identified by having spikes in spines, not only covering their leaves, but their stems. Um, they look evil. Like if you were to get near them, they would reach out and bite you. Those typically tend to be the non-native species. The common, or rather the native species, tend to be much more delicate, much more friendly looking, if you can attribute that to a plant, including a wheeler's thistle. It has a smooth stem, it has a very delicate flower. They actually had a really great year last year, um, so I expect to see hopefully some, quite a few this year as well. Um, Something else that these particular plants do provide in addition to their seeds, which a lot of our um, finches and uh, smaller birds like to feed on, is a fluffy um, tail that is the seed is attached to. So these seeds will often be wind dispersed once they're ripe and ready to leave, but that fluffy tail part is actually also can be used for um, nest lining. So it's you could almost consider it a habitat plant as well. So in addition to the, the thistles, um, you can't you know, offer, talk about seeds without mentioning our wonderful sunflowers. So the annual sunflower, which is Helianthus annuus, is the one that you typically see filling fields and making these huge panoramics of beautiful yellow sunflowers you know, right in front of the peaks. Those typically are the annual sunflowers. The Helianthus maximiliana, I, I can't even say it either, maximiliani um, or maximilian sunflower um, has a little bit different appearance. It can be pretty tall, probably six to seven feet tall. It forms very nice clumps. Um, it has a solid yellow center instead of a brown center. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just beautiful. It's a very beautiful looking sunflower. Um, it doesn't look weedy like sometimes the annual sunflowers can. And then some seeds that people oftentimes don't think about, although they're everywhere here in Northern Arizona, are the seeds of pines and firs and spruces. So Picea pungens is a beautiful conifer species. Um, they the blue spruce, as it's commonly known, has this kind of bluish tinge to its uh, needle foliage. Um, there's also a greenish variety as well, but the blue is way, way prettier. Um, but these cones will produce seeds that are available, again, for long periods um, of the year and provide one of those longer uh, seed sources that are really um, important for birds. Um, and they're beautiful and they can get really big. So I didn't list the height there. All right, so moving on. So some of our habitat species. So in addition to needing food, like humans, birds also need a break from the wind. So being able to offer some form of shelter, be it, uh, you know, maybe it's um, a fence or some, a trellis with climbing flowers on it, windbreak, or trees or shrubs, being able to offer this kind of habitat amendment is a great way to kind of build a community that birds are going to want to hang out in. So some of my favorite woody species um, and shrubs include the red osier dogwood or Cornus stolonifera. Um, this is a good picture of it that you're seeing here because it kind of gives you an idea that it, 
you know, in height, it usually can get to five, maybe six feet tall is pretty typical. Here it says to eight feet. I don't know if I've seen one locally that that's that tall, but it forms really nice clumps. So it's deciduous. So when it is in bloom or in leaf, it forms a really nice kind of, the center is very open, but the leaves are big and kind of form a nice canopy over a more open center. Um, so it's a great place for birds to kind of get in and hide. And um, when it drops its leaves, it has these beautiful bright red stems, which are just gorgeous to look at even in the winter time. Um, so it's very attractive in addition to being very beneficial. Um, the next species that you see there is Amelanchier utahensis or Utah serviceberry. So this is a shrub to a small tree. That's how it's categorized. Um, the nice thing about service berries is that they bloom very early. So as early as April. So it can be one of those early season um, nectar sources um, and food sources and foliage sources um, for birds. Because here, you know, up up at 7,000 feet, you don't start seeing a lot of flowers and leaves until, well, about right now, which is, you know, uh, very end of April, getting close to early May. So it's nice to have some, some early flowering species. Um, Emily, your service berry has got a, a really, some really fun stories about how it got its common name, but, you know, just real quickly, one of the stories that I heard is called that is because once you saw the service berries start to flower and break bud and show their leaves, that meant that the ground was soft enough that services could be held. And when I say services, I mean funeral services could be held and people could be buried. Um, it's also oftentimes called the salmon berry because it indicated a time when the salmon run would happen. Anyways, it's just one of those plants that has really fun stories attached to its name, but it also has a lot of great uh, beneficial traits um, as well. And then the next species over here is Juniperus depiana. So alligator juniper is by far my favorite local juniper. It has beautiful bark. It has a beautiful structure. Um, they're very drought tolerant and hardy. They produce great berries that uh, wildlife, including the birds, love. So this specimen in the picture could be, you know, 900 years old. Now, are you going to be able to see that in your lifetime if you start from seed? Probably not. Um, but you can encourage them to grow and you can oftentimes buy them as smaller trees and encourage them. So if we don't plant them now, then they won't ever get planted. Um, so it's a good species still to work with and try to incorporate um, and just know that it's just going to be around probably a lot longer than most of us. These can get to about 50 feet in height. Um, they're a great berry producer. They um, also produce a really great habitat for birds to roost in and nest in. Um, well, this one is my favorite one. Just know that any of the local junipers can provide similar resources. We have a common juniper, which is much more shrub-like. There's one seed juniper, Utah juniper. Um, I think the birds aren't very particular about which of the berries they prefer. Um, so any of those would serve a similar purpose. All right, so I don't want to take up too much time talking about all these cool, amazing species, but I do want to let you know um, or talk a little bit about a diversity recap. Um, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I got a plug. There we go. Um, First of all, the first point, first lesson that we want to remember is offering a smorgasbord of foodstuffs. So the more variety that you can offer in terms of what birds might be attracted to come and feed on, the more birds you are more likely going to be able to see. Um, pay attention to the species that you have and the species that you might want to introduce and look at the bloom times of those plants. Look at the fruiting times. Look at the seed timings. Try to offer things that bloom at different periods, that fruit at different periods, that will seed at different periods, 
So you can extend that food offering or smorgasbord as long as you possibly can. Use every dimension of your available space. So this includes the width, depth, and height um, of your space that you can um, use to attract the birds. So have plants at different levels, have them some single plants here, have clumps of plants here, because not every bird likes to feed alone, but not every bird likes to feed in company. So having some single plants versus clumps of plants will kind of allow that um, as a feeding option. Play with the rainbow of colors. There are so many different colored native species to choose from. Um, have fun with that. I mean, there's, I always like to get as many as I can, but I know some people are like, well, the trip in my house is this color, so I want something to match that. Um, that's, that's not my style. You can probably do that if, if it is your style, but I like to say mix it up. Um, provide habitat in addition to food. So again, this is the one thing that people maybe think less about is like, so I've got some birds that are coming through, they're migrating, like they're probably really tired. They're gonna need places to sit. They want places to rest that feel safe. They um, not only wanna eat, but need a safe place to spend the night. How can I provide that? What can I give them to encourage that? <laughs> this is probably when I was with the Arboretum, probably the top question that I got where does one find these plants? So I talked about all these really cool native plants. Hopefully you're all encouraged to go out and find them yourself so that you can add them to your own landscapes. Um, where do you get them? So obviously the first place I'm going to recommend, because I think they have the best stock and they have the biggest diversity is gonna be the Arboretum at Flagstaff. I just looked on the website uh, this afternoon they are planning two plant sales, July 16th and September 11th this year. So mark those on your calendars. Um, Warner's Nursery is a great place to find some of those woody species, shrubs and trees in particular. Um, they typically do kind of have a smaller uh, native um, perennial section, um, but it can be kind of hit or miss. Um, I know less about violas, um, but I'd like to think they also have some native offerings. I know in the community, at least when I was still with the ARB, that there are a lot of smaller growers here in the Flagstaff community. And I think some of them are starting to sell their plants at the farmer's market, which I also heard, I think opens May 1st or around that area. So it's another place to look. And then this last option is self-collecting. So what does that mean? So if you have friends that have native gardens and you're, you're friendly with those friends, say, hey, I really like that species. Can I come collect some of the seeds in the fall or when the seeds are ready? And hopefully they'd say, yeah, and they would encourage that. Um, so that's one thing you can do. Collecting on public lands. If you are collecting for your own personal use, then yes you can collect on the forest. You do not need a permit for that. If you are collecting with the intent to sell or com commercially release and produce seed, you do need a permit. And that has to go through the reg forest regional office in Albuquerque. It's not an easy process. It's a lot of paperwork. Just collect a little handful for yourself. It's a lot easier. Um, but that is allowed. Um, so there's different places you can go and collect seed. Um, and then, of course, you've got to start them and nurture them until they're big enough to go out into your garden landscape. Um, but that in itself is also very rewarding. And I got to say, this picture probably gives it away. What is the best way to attract all birds and any kind of birds? water. So if you can provide, especially in this environment where it is so dry, it can be so hot, the best thing that you can probably offer these birds is a water source, be it a little pond or a bird bath. And I've seen people set out misters and sprinklers and, you know, wildlife here is oftentimes desperate for water, especially in the month of June um, when we just don't seem to have any 
Um, I've got a little bird bath out in my front yard and the birds love it. The squirrels love it. The skunks love it. <laughs> Pretty much uh, every wildlife. I'm sure if I could stay up late enough and watch the deer, the deer love it. They will come over and put their little noses in it. Um, but offering water is a great way to attract all kinds of different birds, especially ones that, you know, maybe are more strictly insect eating or um, even raptors. I haven't ever seen a raptor at my bird bath, probably because it's too small. Um, but water is a great thing to be able to offer as well. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions using, I think we can use the chat feature. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so that hopefully we can answer any questions if you have any. Thanks, Chris. I wanna invite everybody to go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question and just ask it directly. Sure. And if not, that is okay too. Chris, this is Dennis down Hi, here Dennis. in the, the beautiful, warm, green, wet, verde valley. Ugh, uh, so jealous. Not that I'm prejudiced, mind you, but I lived in Flagstaff for 18 years. And one thing I discovered was there's not a lot of what seems to be dirt uh, or technically soil in Flagstaff. Um, to, to, do, to make a lot of these species really flourish, is it necessary to bring in bags of soil? The quick answer to that is no. Now that doesn't mean you don't need to do any soil preparation. So a lot of the soils, especially around homes, tends to get very compacted. And our soils here, like you said, they're not very good. They're either really heavy in clay or they're really porous and cindery. So if they're porous and cindery, one thing you can do is add some organic material to that to help retain that moisture. You can also add a light fluffy organic material to a heavy clay soil to lighten that up as well. So even before you, let's say you have some gallon sized plants that you're ready to put in the ground, just turning that soil over with a shovel, lightening it up, you know, you want that hole to be two times as wide and two times as deep, essentially. You're going to backfill it with light, fluffy stuff. You could use potting soil at that point if you wanted to, but you don't have to if it's a native plant. Um, it just, it depends on how much babying you want to give it. Um, the most crucial part when people do introduce plants is knowing that you still have to water it. So native plants, while they are drought adapted, they're still very susceptible when they're first reintroduced into a soil habitat. So if you're taking a plant from a pot and you're putting it in the ground, you know, there's going to be some shock there and it needs time to establish that root system and get it up and growing on its own. Usually I tell people if we're not in monsoon period and it's not raining on a regular basis, make sure you're watering it probably every two or three days at least um, for at least the first few weeks to make sure it gets established. Once established, then it should have those wonderful drought adapted characteristics that many of our native plants have. But you got to get it to that point. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi. Hi. Did I come on? I'm Roy. I hear you. In Flagstaff. Uh, hey, thanks for the talk. Very, very helpful. Sure. I put out some columbines the other day. Hopefully that might attract some. But where I live uh, in a condo, I'm not allowed to put out a whole lot. In fact, I'm not allowed to put out anything, but do this anyway. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> I won't tell. We can do things clan, uh, clandestinely. Uh, but without uh, launching into another <laughs> whole lecture, how is climate change affecting or going to affect things like uh, the plants you specifically mentioned this evening or the columbines that I just put in the ground or, or what have you. I presume that uh, these can be affected. Also, the, uh, 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 we would all like to live as, well, I don't know, but we think we'd like to live as long as the alligator juniper, but uh, how, are, how are they going to be affected by, by climate change or how are they being affected by climate change? 
So probably the number one impact on plants that have has been documented is the earlier earlier bud break. Um, and by bud break, I mean both leaf bud break and flower bud break. So there's some really great long-term studies that have looked at different species around the globe and have noticed that, oh, look at this tree species. It's breaking bud earlier and earlier and earlier. And there's a, this really interesting cycle. There's a, a great study looking at, I want to say it's a Spanish swallow. It's migratory. So it's dependent on when it migrates back to Spain on their being these fat, juicy caterpillars ready for it to feed its young. So the whole cycle is kind of based on the swallows arrive back in Spain when the caterpillars are fat and juicy and they're most nutritious. But as the tree's phenology has changed, meaning it started its leaf bud break and flower bud break much earlier, the caterpillars have also shifted with the plant. But that third partner, the bird, has not been able to keep up because it's migratory. It has a, a weaker link or weaker connection. And so when the birds are arriving now, those caterpillars are no longer fat and juicy. Now all they have to, to feed their babies are these hard, crusty insects, which um, what they've seen is a decline in the fledging um, levels of these birds um, and nest survivorship. And so it's, it's, it's kind of, you've got to really think big picture. So when you shift the timing of one organism, even if another organism can keep up with it, it doesn't mean the succeeding or the following organism will be able to keep up with that. So it, it really kind of throws a monkey wrench into all these systems and cycles that, you know, we would consider normal, um, but are now really kind of suffering because they just can't keep up with the change and how fast it's happening. So that's probably the biggest effect that climate change is having on plants is just showing these shifts in when they open their buds and when they flower. Now, I don't know if any of you have lilacs, but lilacs are notorious, you know, early bud breakers, but they also notoriously break their bud um, before the end of the freezing season and they get those things nipped off. Um, but this is one of those species where, you know, a plant only has so much energy that it can pull. And if it's spent all its energy on, on continually breaking leaf buds, it doesn't have anything left to make flowers. Then it has less to make seed. And then it's just, it impacts its reproductive cycle. So there's a lot of different ways that climate change can impact plants, but if you think about it, the timing of when those plants are doing their thing is also going to impact all those other living organisms that are dependent on those plants. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. It's quite a conundrum. <laughs> I wish we could just turn that dial back a little bit, but it has not yet happened. Along those lines, I've got a question about, because um, uh, in your bio it said that you study the pinyon juniper mm -hmm. habitats. And so we, Roy, started, got us um, started with pinyon uh, J surveys. And oh, it's, yeah, up in Flagstaff, it's been, uh, it's been really good. I don't know how they've been affected by the fire up there. But um, what my Habitat loss. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, uh, just I have just a whole lot of questions about that. About like, um, at what age and height do the pinion uh, pinion pines begin to produce cones? Ooh, it's not a height issue. It's definitely an age issue. I would say. You know, you could have a pinion seedling, and again, this is all relative to how much water it gets. So if it's in a spot where it gets runoff from the road, it's gonna grow quite a bit faster than one that's 100 feet from the road and gets less water. So you could have a pinion pine seedling, seedling, so a small pinion pine that comes up to your knee, that could be 15 years old. They're incredibly slow growing. 
Um, I'm not sure, I can't answer this, like what is the trigger for when it reaches reproductive maturity? Um, if I had to guess, I'd probably say, you know, somewhere in the 15 to 20 years. But again, it just, it really is very resource dependent. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've seen some very, very small pinions that still will have a cone on them. Um, but it's because they've been so, they're very old. They're just very small because they've been growing so slowly because they're so resource deprived. So that's a, that's a tricky one. Okay, so and then when, wh what time of, is it the fall when they, because I looked online and it, and it, uh, it said that they, the, the seeds would be ready in October. Is that, when, when would they be ready? The seeds are ready, I would say early fall. So the fall season, so September, October, probably into November, um, maybe now even as early as late August, but that might be a bit much. Um, so they form these tight little green balls and as they mature, they're very resinous, so super sticky. As they mature, they get bigger and fatter and then they've got to you know, warm up and dry out enough so that they open and release those seeds or at least become accessible. Um, but yeah, probably the, the, I would say very late August to early November. Okay, great. Um, we had, we were going to have a, a cone survey and they were going to train us how to survey the cones and then that got put on hold. But I think that's going to happen, you know, next year. And so that probably will give us a little bit info on then kind of what to expect, um, you know, as far as the cone crop. That's right. There is a um, research group at NAU that has been collecting exactly that type of data for like 30 years. Mm -hmm. So that data set exists. I do not know if they're still collecting those same data sets, um, but I could put you in contact with somebody who does if you're interested in um, just knowing what they've learned and what they have I'm sure they probably published quite a bit of it um, but they um, have <laughs> well they had this great set of research trees at um, uh, Sunset Crater <laughs> I don't know if they're still there but um, yeah but yeah I know they have probably 20 almost 30 years of data on that so just in general, is there anything else that we could know about pinion pines that could help us with that survey that you can think of? Well, what is, what is the intention of the survey? What do you want to know about the pines that are, you're connecting to the birds? What's happening is the Forest Service was going to do a landscape scale, huge landscape scale. Um, 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 action where they would actually be removing trees to for grassland birds to help the grassland birds. But what, hmm. what happened was a uh, uh, lady at Southwest Audubon that you mentioned said, mm, we might want to try to find the, the trees that the colonies are nesting in and make sure that we don't remove those trees that, uh, you know, if, if they keep going back to the same trees in the same area, we don't want to remove those trees. So that's, that's the purpose of our surveys, figure out where they're nesting and make sure that we, you know, flag those trees. We, we, you can't approach them you, uh, because predators will watch you go towards a tree where they're nesting. Even snakes will watch. Mm -hmm. um, so you've yeah. got to be real careful. And we're, we're just tasked with trying to look, you know, uh, we've got a, app called survey one two three and we're using that in conjunction with the greater uh great basin bird observatory and um they're tracking kind of you know the directions that that these pinion jays are moving so we can narrow down where they're nesting tricky um so the other thing about pinions like a lot of different pine species is they tend to be a masting species which means they won't necessarily produce cones and seeds every year. You know, it could be a couple of years, could be five years. 
somehow everything all comes together and boom, every single tree is, every, every female tree is producing um, cones and seeds. Um, so it's, it's like a boom and a bust cycle. So you might go bust, 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 and then you'll have a boom year. Um, so they're not always super predictable that way. Um, and I don't know, do the jays typically roost in the trees that are the cone producing trees? Not necessarily. I, I think at the training, Roy, you might remember that. I remember them saying that they roost away, uh, away from the nesting trees. Is that correct? Well, they roost away from uh, navy, uh, the nesting trees, but they, they roost in the trees and roost in colonies. So they're going to be around. Right. So. I wonder, if, I mean, if you could tag some of those birds, you know, put a little tracer on them. I, I, Ty saw, and recapture. I saw, yeah, I saw her at the Verde Valley Birding Festival, um, and she mentioned that. She said, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? But she said, they're corvids, and they're, they're very smart, and you get one chance. It's true. And if you miss, you'll, you'll never, so they'll tell the whole colony, and you'll, you'll never get another chance. It's true, but if you could just get one of them to go back to the colony and trace it. <laughs> You just need one. <laughs> well, thank you. I took up a lot of time on pinion okay. phase. Um, other people might have questions about what to plant. I just, I wanted to add that uh, the, uh, so I haven't seen out where the fire has been going, but uh, one of the major survey zones that we tagged is the uh, Strawberry Crater area. And that's exactly where the, where the fire has gone, gone through. Uh, so it doesn't bode well. On the other hand, uh, I have seen great flocks of uh, pinion jays in uh, burned over areas. So uh, I don't know, we'll I see what, uh, what they can do and how badly it's burned on beyond uh, 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 Strawberry Crater, but obviously it doesn't, the fire doesn't bode well for, the, for pinion um, jays in that area at least. It yeah. doesn't, which, is, which makes me sad, but. I guess one good bit of news is that pinion juniper habitat is the third largest vegetation type in the continental U.S. So hopefully there will be some place for them to go. Okay. Hey, hi, Chris. Thank you so much for this presentation tonight. Sure. It's very timely. Um, I just bought a, a place up in Prescott and I'm trying to introduce native species. And Yay. another thing is, yeah, <laughs> I'd like to um, also attract some bluebirds. I have a bluebird nest box that I've put into the, the yard and I want to know what else would draw the birds. All right, so bluebirds are very particular about their nesting habitat and their boxes. So they really like edge habitat where you're kind of got some forest or some tree line and it opens up into meadow. That's why you'll oftentimes see them roosting and sitting on fence lines. Um, I don't know if this book is still available. I'm gonna hold it up so you can see it. It's probably backwards, but it's called Bluebirds and Their Survival. And it's by, I'll just tell you, Wayne H. Davis and Philippe Roca, R-O-C-A. So coincidentally, Wayne H. Davis was my undergraduate um, mentor and uh, advisor when I was at the University of Kentucky. He had a passion as well for bluebirds. But if you can find a copy of this book, he tells you all about bluebirds, how to make the boxes, how to mount the boxes, how to protect from predators, um, what other things they'll feed, how to photograph the birds. I mean, it's, it's pretty inclusive. Um, and while a lot of it does pertain to the eastern bluebird, all of this still applies to the western bluebird and mountain bluebird as well. Um, so if you can find a copy of that, that would be the best resource that I can think of. Um, it was put out by the University of Kentucky Press, if that helps. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll have a look. Um, but I know they like a certain height and a certain gap 
gap size in the box, certain depth of the box, they're finicky. Yeah. But um, providing nest boxes is a great way. Um, anything that will produce a uh, fruit or a berry that will supplement their insect diet with fruits and berries. Um, and then just, you know, some good habitat, some places to roost and sit and chill and watch predator free <laughs> and water. Okay, great. I have a Creek right next to my property. I don't <laughs> You're know so if lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely have water envy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> All right, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah, well, we ran a little bit over your, your time, so sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that what's gonna happen is we'll probably have a lot of people uh, review this on our Facebook page because this video will be archived there and okay. I, I, there's a lot of interest in native plants down here and, um, yeah so I think that we'll probably have a lot of people that'll come back around and and um, I, I wanted to thank Janet May for getting you to give us this talk tonight and Roy May and um, thank you for putting this on. This was great. I mean, I, usually it feels like you get bombarded with way too much information and too many plants and I just go, oh, I can't deal with it. And I just, yeah, quit. that so is I easy like, to do. <laughs> I like those really, you know, the, the specific points that you gave us. So thank you yeah. very much. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, and you know, best of luck with your future studies, and um, we'll keep our fingers crossed that the damage out there in Sunset and Strawberry Crater wasn't that bad. <laughs> I haven't been out there either yet, so I don't think it's open. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, and um, we'll be in touch by email to get some more of these details together. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Kay. Thank you.